Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Right. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for making it to the right room. We've had to move because um, the drilling work next door um, cannot guarantee an hour of silence. Uh, in here, we will avoid it all. Uh, it's a great pleasure to present Sagan. He's going to talk to us this morning about uh, his work. He's been with us for the last two and a half years. I'm sure most of you know him, so I won't do uh, an excessive introduction. If, if you don't know him, uh, you know, shame on you for not uh, getting to talk to people in the lab. So with that, Sergey, over to you. Rethinking storage and networking in next generation racks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. So uh, in my talk today, I'm going to describe the work I've been doing uh, during my postdoc over the last two and a half years uh, in building more efficient racks. But before we dive into the technical details, let me give you a brief overview uh, of my background. So uh, uh, my experience with you guys started a while ago, back in 2011, when I joined uh, as an intern to work uh, on an in-memory key value store uh, called Jekyll and Hyde. And this was uh, an extremely positive and constructive experience for me, because back then uh, I had to, for the first time, design and implement a system from scratch. So I really like this approach. And so one and a half year later, after defending my PhD from INRIA in Paris, I joined uh, as a postdoc uh, to work uh, on designing next generation racks in data centers. So basically, the high level goal of my work has been to rethink how we design racks to make them cheaper to build, more efficient, and higher performance as well. And for that, I've been looking at hardware trends that were emerging in data centers and applying them at the scale of the rack. So I like to think of um, uh, the research I've been doing as a combination of a clean slate design, where basically I rethink how to efficiently, the most efficiently possible design a system that is targeted at some workload requirements. And often that requires uh, a clean slate approach where hardware and software are co-designed at rack scale for uh, some requirements. But then uh, it's also a good thing to implement uh, the principles that have been isolated during the first phase and show that on the realistic setup uh, deployment, this, uh, these principles apply well. So during my postdoc, um, some of these principles uh, have been published in a top tier conference paper. So this is uh, the paper about Pelican in um, um, basically defining how to efficiently provision and manage resources at, at the scale of the rack. But uh, in addition to that, and so this is something I'm very proud of, uh, we also had internal impact uh, with, with this research. So we have a working prototype of one of our racks currently deployed in a data center, and we also have a Microsoft patent. So uh, this, for me, defines what good systems research should look like, a combination of open research to explore different possibilities in a clean slate way, and then real implementation to show how this works in real setup. So um, in this talk, I'm going to describe two different projects that hopefully will illustrate the approach. Um, and of course, this is work done in a large team of people. And so for each of the projects I will describe, I'm going to um, highlight my contributions to, to the project. Um, but first, a little bit of context. So it's all about increasing uh, the efficiency in data centers. You can think of it as increasing performance per dollars uh, in the, at the scale of the rack. And if we look at how a rack looks like today, it's basically very simple. It's a collection of blade servers that share the same enclosure. Each server is connected to a single top of rack switch with uh, an Ethernet cable. and um, each server has a set of direct attached resources, such as storage and memory. And if you look at that, it's a very partitioned design where each server is basically a shared nothing module. So for example, resources like power and cooling are supplied on a per server basis. So um, uh, each server has its own set of fans, it has its own power supply unit. And uh, the direct attached uh, resources like storage and memory are not by default shared with the rest of the rack. And uh, if 
the server fails, all the resources that are attached to the server become unavailable. So what can we do to improve performance, uh, the efficiency of this, of this uh, design? Well, there's been this emerging vision of rack scale computers that consist of um, thinking of the rack as a whole unit of design, uh, um, management, deployment, and operation. And uh, this allows to remove, to co-design uh, resources within the rack, remove unnecessary hardware, and therefore increase density and reduce capital cost. But also because resources are shared, we increase the utilization, and so we reduce uh, the um, operational cost as well. And because uh, we can now think at the rack scale, we can really optimize the system uh, for data center workloads and increase performance as well. And this vision is backed up by several trends that are emerging in data centers today. So the first one is that the rack is increasingly becoming the unit of deployment, deployment in our data centers. So the data centers are becoming so big that it's not longer cost effective to deploy uh, server by server. We, we lean entire racks or even collections of racks sometimes. The second trend is that within each uh, rack, the density is increasing thanks to hardware integration. And this is in particular visible on uh, silicon because in each server now increasingly with the CPU we have additional features such as I.O. controllers, net, um, well, I.O. memory controllers and sometimes even increasingly the networking is being on the same silicon collocated with the CPU, which makes the server smaller and therefore we can put more of them in the rack. And the final trend is that we increasingly see hardware vendors targeting specific products at data center workloads. This could be something like archival hard drives that are optimized for specific access pattern uh, to data uh, that we see in data centers. Could be programmable NICs that enforce data center wide policies in hardware on the NICs. Or it could be even custom CPUs sometimes. So, uh, in this talk, I'm going to describe two projects that illustrate the challenges and the benefit of the approach of rack scale computing. So the first one is Pelican, which is a storage rack for unfrequently accessed data. And in Pelican, we isolate the principles of how resources should be accurately provisioned for the workload and managed carefully at the scale of the rack. And this is a, a big collaboration with uh, Microsoft uh, Cambridge, Redmond, and Azure Storage. Um, but here in Microsoft Cambridge, I would like to thank uh, Richard, Austin, and uh, Ant. And in the second part, I will talk about uh, networking. So Xfabric is a rack scale network that optimizes the network at the, at the scale of the rack by reconfiguring dynamically the physical topology of the network to match the uh, workload requirements. And this is a work with uh, Nick Chen, Dan Kletherho, uh, Hugh Williams, and Anne Trostrom here in Cambridge. But first, uh, let's talk about Pelican. So Pelican is a storage rack designed to store data that is unfrequently accessed. It's written once and then read rarely. And we know it represents a significant fraction of the data we store in the cloud, and so we really need to make sure we store this data efficiently. So if you look at the storage technologies available today, you can see that every technology makes a specific trade-off between latency, whoops, sorry, between latency of access and cost. So for example, SSDs um, are very low latency. They have latencies in the order of tens of microseconds, but they're very expensive. Then you have slightly cheaper, but slightly higher latency enterprise disks. Finally, commodity drives, and in the end you have tape, which is extremely cheap, but offers latency of access in several minutes to several hours. And because of this specific trade-off each technology makes, it's naturally well suited to store a particular type of data. So for example, SSDs in enterprise are great for hot storage, uh, data which is very frequently accessed and requires low latency of access. Slightly cooler but still warm data is well serviced by commodity drives. And finally, tape, because it has such a high latency of access, is only good for archival workloads, which is basically written once and never read back. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, what about cold data then, which 
represents a large fraction of what we store. Well, um, none of these technologies is well suited to store cold data. And what happens is that tape has too high latency for this cold data that is still accessed from time to time. And therefore, cold data ends up being in a hot or warm tier. And this is perfectly okay for performance because we have high throughput and low latency, but it's very bad for cost because these tiers are provisioned for peak performance and therefore cost per gigabyte is really high. So instead, if we want to improve uh, this, we would like to have a cold tier uh, that is low cost enough to store archival data and compete with tape, but also uh, low latency enough to store cold data at the same time. And that's what Pelican does. So Pelican is a building block to build such a tier. And if we compare it to tape, it has a cost which is comparable, um, but offers better performance because it's a disk-based appliance. And to reduce costs, the key is to write provision resources within the rack. And by that I mean that we need to provision just enough resources to enable efficient um, workload operation, but no more. So for example, uh, instead of using commodity drives, uh, Pelican is designed for archival and SMR drives that are specifically targeted at unfrequent access. Uh, we provision just enough power, cooling, and bandwidth in the rack, just enough to satisfy the requirements of the workload, but not for peak performance. So for example, we don't have enough resources even to have all the disks active within the rack. Uh, for compute, we just have enough for efficient data management and um, no more. So we remove a lot of servers out of the rack and we end up with just two. And because they are just two servers, we can directly connect them to the data center and remove the top of rack switch as well. So, Intuitively, what we did here is that we moved away from this very partitioned traditional rack design to something which, uh, in which the resources are um, converged and um, provisioned just for the requirements at the scale of the rack. And so uh, this allows us to increase density and reduce cost because we remove unnecessary hardware from the enclosure. And also because we, because the, the rack is designed just for the requirements of the workload, the performance is capped and therefore the power consumption is lower and the operational cost is reduced as well. So that's uh, uh, how Pelican looks like. This is one of the earliest uh, prototypes we have. It's a converged design in which power, cooling, mechanical storage and software are all co-designed together for the cold data workload. It has 1,152 disks in a 52U uh, rack, which is a standard rack in, in data centers. And the density that we obtain is much higher than in traditional disk-based storage. And this particular prototype, because it, has, it uses four terabyte drives, is um, uh, able to store over five petabytes of raw storage within a single rack. And the key of the design, and I insist on that, is that resources are right provisioned for the workload. And in very practically, this means that at most 8% of the disks in the rack can be active uh, concurrently. And um, doing that, we reduce the total cost of ownership and make it comparable to tape. But because it's a disk-based appliance, the latency is lower. However, uh, right provisioning uh, induces constraints on resources within the rack. And so, because not all the sets of disks can be active at any given time, and therefore the software stack needs to be um, specialized to handle these resource constraints at the scale of the rack. And in particular, there are two key mechanisms within the storage stack that needs to be uh, constrained to where. And this is the data placement that determines on which disks uh, the data will be stored and the I.O. scheduling that determines in which order requests on the data will be serviced. And uh, the design of these two components is my first contribution uh, to this project. But let's first look at uh, the impact of right provisioning on resources. So if you think about a fully provisioned system, well, all the disks are active at all the time, so there are no resource constraints. 
And in contrast, in a write provision system, each disk is part of a domain for each resource it consumes. So for example, here, the disk D is part of a vertical cooling domain and horizontal power domain. And the key here is that each domain has only a limited set of resources for all of the disks uh, it, it, it contains. And so a disk can only be active if there is enough resources across all of the domains that it is part of for all the resources. And in this example, there are only two domains, but um, in Pelican we have four. We have power, cooling, vibration, and bandwidth. And in a general write provision system, you could imagine having an arbitrary number of uh, domains depending on the resources they require. And these domains in Pelican have induced resource constraints. So we have, uh, for example, only two disks that can be active out of 16 per power domain, one active out of 12 per cooling domain, and one out of two per vibration domain. And these listed here are hard constraints, meaning that if we violate them, something bad can happen to the hardware or to the data. So for example, if we vibrate, if we um, violate the power constraint, basically uh, a fuse will trip within the rack, leading to 16 disks being unavailable for a period of time and can even f um, lead to increased failure rates for these disks because they have not been spun down cleanly when they, the power went down. Uh, and uh, so these are hard constraints, but there are also soft constraints like bandwidth, which if we violate it, we only have performance degradation. And so for both hard and soft constraints, the uh, software needs to enforce these constraints and operate within them efficiently. And the first component for the software is the data placement. So in Pelican, we store blobs that are basically large chunks of data. And we erasure encode them. And this means that we fragment the blob into a set of smaller fragments, and we add some redundancy blocks redundancy fragments to this data. And the erasure encoding guarantees that if we store each fragment on a separate disk, we can survive several disk failures because we have some redundancy and we are able to reconstruct the blob. And um, for in Pelican, for um, performance reasons, we also enforce that all the disks that store a blob need to be concurrently active to access the data. And so uh, here, for example, we have one blob that is, for, as an example, stored on three randomly selected black disks. And we can see the impact on the cooling and power domains that this uh, decision has. Now, in a fully provisioned system, we don't have uh, this impact because we don't have domains, there are no constraints. And so we can basically select any random sets of disks for any blob, and this has no impact on concurrency. Now, in a write provision system, uh, we uh, cannot spin up any sets of disks concurrently because some sets have conflicting resource uh, requirements. So, uh, and because we enforce that sets of disks need to be concurrently active to access the data, it means that if we randomly select two blobs to read, if their sets conflict, we won't be able to access these blobs concurrently. And so we end up uh, having to serialize the access. And so the challenge here intuitively that uh, um, placement has an impact on concurrency and we need to minimize that for any randomly selected blobs, the probability of conflict, uh, well, that's, that's what we need to minimize. And this is not uh, a simple, this is not so simple to do. And to, to show you that, uh, let's uh, think of a very simple random approach for the placement and see why it doesn't work well. So for random placement, let's assume we selected the disks of blob one randomly, and now we need to, to select disks for a second blob to be stored. And so every time we will pick a disk at random for blob two, the probability that there will be a conflict with the disks of blob one uh, grows with uh, the number of disks of one, say n, and three, three in, that, in that example. And now uh, as we go further, the probability increases and eventually the, with high probability we'll select a disk that will conflict with one of the disks of blob one, meaning that we'll need to have sequential access for blob one and blob two. And so if you think about it, uh, in the general case, if we store a, each blob over n disks, the probability that two random blobs will conflict will be growing in, in, uh, with n squared. 
And uh, so this practically means that if we select a wide enough erasure coding scheme, like something uh, like 10 or 15 um, fragments per blob, we end up with a very high probability that all the requests have to be serialized. Uh, so in, t in Pelican, we are doing better. And we are basing the placement on the intuition that it's uh, much more efficient to concentrate all the resource conflicts uh, across over a few sets of disks, leaving them completely independent from the rest of the rack. So in Pelican, um, we partition disks into groups such that each, uh, all the disks in the same group are able to concurrently spin up. And we are aiming to enforce the property that two randomly selected groups are either fully conflicting for all of their disks or are completely independent. And I'm going to now show how we can build such groups. Yeah? Are you saying that you're optimizing for average case retrieval time at the expense of some very bad worst case? Or did I misunderstand that? Um, no. When so you say you put all the conflicts in one place, do you mean that so the data that's stored there could, have, could be fully serialized and have, have a very long retrieval time? Yes, but the, the idea is that basically we are um, like um, partial conflict if only one disk in, in among two sets is conflicting is as bad as if they are all conflicting. So it's better to have... Um, you, see, you see the point, right. Yeah? Maybe I don't understand this erasure coding. I thought you said I'm going to split my blob among 11 disks but I only need 10 of them to be alive in order to reconstruct the blob. Yes. Okay, so one isn't bad at all. Um, but the thing is that uh, we are spinning up all of them because we need to perform some checks to see whether the data is still valid. So we spin them, when we access data, we spin them all up. Uh, but there's some sense of it, you, you've over, um, you, you've added some error correction. But You don't so need all of it. No, time. but, but the, in the erasure coding, you have relatively small number of, uh, array, uh, of redundancy. So you still need a large majority of the disks to be active to access the data. Uh, but not all of them. Well, you don't need them all, but in our design, we are accessing them all because we're really careful about whether they're um, basically um, scrubbing on the disk and seeing whether the data is still valid. But, but you, you're right, we don't need them all, but we still need a large majority. So for example, we're using like 15 plus 3, and we need at least 15 to be active. Yeah, I just don't understand, because it means it turns the hard constraint into a soft constraint, because it's if only 2% of the time you don't do your full error yeah, checking. Yes, this is true, but this complicates the scheduling, because you need to... Uh, yeah. yeah. To use an off-the-shelf standard coding scheme, could there exist an optimized coding scheme that's tuned to the particular constraints in your system? Is there a, is there a research issue there? Is the scheme optimal? Uh, so we use something off-the-shelf, but the, um, possibly. Mm. Oh, yeah, so we, we use something. We need to erasure and code at streamline. We need to be really fast, so we're using something that is proving to be uh, efficient and fast. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, so how can we form these groups? Well, if here's the side view of the rack, and uh, if we select one of the one disks on the bottom corner, we can see how it uses a power domain and a cooling domain. Now, if I select one disk up in the diagonal, we can see that it shares no power and no cooling domain, and therefore there is no possibility of conflict. And uh, therefore these two disks can be spun up concurrently. Now, if we take all the disks in this diagonal, we can see this is true for all of them. So all these disks can be concurrently spun up, and therefore this black diagonal represents a well-formed group of 12 disks. So if we now take um, the same diagonal but shift it one disk down, we end up with the second group which is also well formed. But more importantly, it has the property that each disk of the gray group will conflict with one of the black disks, meaning that we completely um, um, concentrate all the conflicts between these two groups. And this also means that these two groups are independent from the rest of the rack. So 
you can see that they share no cooling domain with the rest of the rack. Uh, they still some, share some, uh, some power domains. But remember that in, in Pelican, we, we can inf we, each power domain can have enough, can have two disks spinning. And therefore, this doesn't represent a conflict. So all the conflicts are concentrated in this darker area for these two groups. And this is um, also true for all the rotations of this black diagonal, meaning that by forming uh, these diagonals, we actually end up with, by having 12 groups that are all fully conflicting with each other and are all completely dependent from the rest of the rack. And this is uh, what we call a class in Pelican. And so if we now enforce that we store each blob in a particular group only, so a blob doesn't span different groups, we uh, see that the probability of the conflict of two randomly selected blobs is now in the order of n. And um, another nice property is that these groups fully encapsulate all the constraints, which means that um, at runtime, when we need to spin up disks, we don't need to worry about all the fine grain constraints for each, for each of them. We just need to know in which group uh, the blob is going to be. And we know automatically all the conflicts. So this simplifies the scheduling significantly, and now we only reason about groups. So I showed you an example with 12 disks, but in Pelican we have 24 disks and we have uh, 48 groups. But the same principle applies here. We have classes, we have four of them uh, that are independent, and therefore the concurrency is four if the request, if requests are randomly distributed across classes. Sorry. And um, in Pelican, a blob is stored over 18 disks, and this is due to the erasure coding scheme we use, and that has been picked to fit with the workload requirements in terms of durability and um, uh, throughput as well. So, um, for, uh, so this was the data placement. For the scheduler, the key, um, the key constraint, the key challenge is that uh, it takes a lot of time to spin up a group. So from what we measured, uh, this was quite a while ago, but uh, basically it takes around 14 seconds to spin up a group. And this includes spinning up all the 24 disks, mount their file systems, and perform various checks before doing I.O. So, um, if we um, service requests over one class, we can only have one group in that class out of 12 active at, the, uh, at one time. And this means that if we have a queue of requests on that class uh, and we process it in five order with relatively high probability, we end up requiring to spin up a new group after each request. And this is really bad for uh, utilization because basically we'll spend our time doing spin ups. Uh, so instead of doing that, we are actually batching requests per, uh, per group. Um, and this is done to perform a decent amount of I.O. once a group is up. But the challenge with batching is that implicitly it, uh, it, uh, it triggers some reordering compared to the five order because some requests in the batch will be processed ahead of their five order. And this can lead to unfairness. And so in Pelican, we bound the batching time um, the, the, the amount of batching we do to ensure some fairness. And this is the trade-off between throughput and fairness, and this is a user-specified parameter. Finally, uh, the scheduler can handle um, different types of traffic by weighted fair sharing. So, for example, for rebuild and client, that can happen uh, uh, concurrently. Right, so to evaluate uh, Pelican, we, to evaluate the impact that the right provisioning has, we evaluate Pelican to a system in which all the disks are up uh, simultaneously, and this is a fully provisioned system because there is enough resources for all, and we call it FP for fully provisioned. But because this is really challenging to build, because it requires a lot of resources and a lot of cooling within the same rack, we actually use a fine-grained discrete event simulator that, to compare both systems, and we first cross-validate the simulator with our existing Pelican hardware. And this uh, simulator design and implementation is my second contribution to this, um, to this project. So um, I'm going to present three metrics, the rack throughput, the latency, and the power consumption for these two systems. And we used um, uh, an open loop workload. 
basically, it's a Poisson arrival process, and we perform a parameter sweep across a range of different workload intensities by varying the lambda of the Poisson arrival. Uh, and we vary the request uh, rate up to eight requests per second. Now, that's, that may seem small, but because the requests are over one gig blobs, this actually represents 64 gigabits per second uh, of workload. So first for the throughput, we have the average throughput in function of the workload rate. So this is lightweight workload, and this is a very heavy weight workload. Um, and we first present the results for the random placement I was describing earlier. So basically, uh, the, it's the same Pelican rack, but we replace the Pelican data placement with the random one. And we can see that regardless of the workload, it performs extremely badly. And this is because we end up having a lot of conflicts between requests, and, uh, and so we basically end up processing them sequentially. Now, if we look at uh, FP, we have... Uh, uh, the inverse performance because it's extremely good because everything is provisioned for peak. And in fact, the only bottleneck is the bandwidth out of the rack. This is 40 gigabits per second, and it is saturated when the workload is intense enough. Now, let's have a look at Pelican. Um, so for Pelican, we can see that uh, we are able to handle write provisioning extremely well because up to four requests per second, the performance is actually identical to FP, and this is despite the fact that only 8% of the disks in the rack are active. Uh, and this also illustrates the, the importance of designing the hardware and the software together because if we don't, we end up with performance like this, if we don't, take, um, if we don't manage constraints efficiently at runtime. Now, of course, after a certain point, uh, Pelican plateaus and its performance is below FP. Yeah. What's your fairness in here? It's, uh, or how long is the queue that you inspect? I think it's 500, 500 requests. So we, uh, yes. So, um, yes, but you're right, this is fairness dependent. So um, here we can see that um, we can see the impact of spinning up groups, basically, that is captured by this metric. And we can reduce the, spinning, the number of spinning ups by increasing the batching. Um, but overall, Pelican performs extremely well for that, uh, for that metric. Now, uh, for time to first byte, you need to remember that in Pelican, we inherently, by design, need to spin up groups to process requests. Uh, and we can see that even for the very lightweight workload, the minimum latency we see, time to first byte, is basically the time it takes to spin up a group. Uh, but this is okay because we are targeting cold data workloads that don't have such a low latency requirement. And therefore, this is a reasonable time to wait. And also, it's significantly lower than tape. Uh, of course, FP doesn't have this constraint of spinning up disks, and so it has significantly lower time to first byte. But this is coming at the expense of having all the disks active in the system. And so if we look at the power consumption, this is the aggregate power draw in kilowatts uh, for all the disks in the rack. And to have a baseline, this is what all disks spun down would consume. We, disks that are spun down still consume some, some power because their electronics are up. Um, and so this is 1.8 kilowatts. Now, if we look at all disks active, we can see that it's significantly higher. It's around 11 kilowatts uh, just for a rack. This is very high for a single rack. And this is, by the way, what FP would consume. Now, if we look at Pelican, we can see that it is significantly closer to all disks spun down than all disks active. And um, um, we can see that uh, the power draw actually varies with the workload rate. Because when the workload rate is low, most of the groups are basically spun down. But then when the workload is high, all of them are active because we're doing extensive batching. And in the middle here, we have a lot of disks spinning, spinning up and spinning down. And spinning up a disk takes more power. That's why we see this bump. But overall, even for peak performance, we're nicely capped at 3.7 kilowatts, which represents around 3x lower than uh, FP. So to summarize, in, in this Pelican project, uh, we isolated some um, principles on how resources should be provisioned for the workload requirements and managed dynamically at runtime. 
Um, we uh, have a Pelican prototype deployed in a data center. Uh, unfortunately, it's a public lecture, so I can't really talk about how this is going, but it's going well. <laughs> and, and, and then finally, uh, we ended up having a very generic simulator for rack scale systems. And this simulator not only simulates performance, but also resource consumption. So you can specify an input uh, a rack description describing all the resource constraints in the rack, and it will be able to instantiate that in the simulator and compare it against several different workloads. And it's, fi it's fine grain, it's cross validated against Pelican, and because it's so flexible, uh, it is now used across several projects in the systems and networking group. And um, these two bits are my contribution to the, the Pelican project. So, uh, in the second part, uh, we're going to talk about networking, so this is slightly different context than Pelican because we're not looking at storage racks, but at high density compute racks. So we're talking about hundreds of servers within a single rack. Now, in a traditional rack today, in compute rack, you have something like 40 servers. So we're talking about a significant increase in density. But this is not an unreasonable assumption because over the past few years, several vendors have released products that actually managed to achieve that kind of density um, with existing technology. So we end up with hundreds of servers per rack. And the reason, the commonality between these designs is that they aggressively leverage hardware integration to reduce costs. So they, um, for example, remove all the cabling from the enclosure and then the, the, most of the interconnect is done on printed circuit board. Uh, they use integration on the silicon, and this all aggressively reduces cost. And in particular, one uh, technology that allows to reduce cost is what is called a system on a chip. So a system on a chip is basically a piece of silicon with a CPU and a lot of uh, additional features like I.O. and memory controllers and networking. So, uh, for example, the Boston Varieties uses... Uh, a chip for, from a company called Calzida that is an ARM CPU collocated with a 10 gigabit packet switch with eight ports, all within the same silicon. So we assume that we have a packet switch, a low, very low cost packet switch within each server. And now uh, the way the networking is scaled is uh, that because we have hundreds of servers, it's really hard to have a single top of rack switch with so many ports at high bandwidth. So what these systems do is that they typically remove the top of rack switch and um, they directly connect these small packet switches together, forming what is called a distributed fabric. So we move from the traditional top of rack switch based design in the rack to something which looks like this. So here is, for example, a 3D torus topology, uh, each vertex is a sock and is connected to a set of other socks, six in that case, within the rack. Um, and if, we, if it wants to talk to um, other socks in the rack, it needs to do multi-hop routing within this topology. And this uh, 3D torus topology is, for example, what the uh, IMDC Micro uses. So this is all great for uh, cost because we can now scale the network to hundreds of uh, servers in the rack, but it has a challenge, and the challenge is uh, that this design inherently lacks of flexibility. Because if you think about it, the old top-of-rack switch design is very flexible because the top-of-rack switch is fully provisioned, meaning that all the servers can send and receive data at full line rate within saturate, without saturating the switch. Now, this is no longer the case with these uh, direct connect topologies, meaning that a server cannot send and receive data on all of its ports at full line rate anymore. And this happens because the topology defines fundamental properties like average path lengths and bisection bandwidth. And so uh, the, this network is limited by these properties in the topology. And because the topology is static, we can't really change uh, these, these properties once we build the system. And we know that the best topology uh, is workload dependent. So when workloads are different, the topology behaves better or worse. And uh, this is a big challenge. And for example, um, HP in, this, uh, in its, uh, its um, system has four different separated fabrics with four different topologies for four different workloads. And this is obviously not, not optimal. So to address that challenge, 
uh, we designed XFabric in which the topology can be dynamically changed at runtime, at the physical level. And for that, we use, uh, we design XFabric as a packet switched network running on top of a physical circuit switch topology. So uh, let me describe it a bit better. So um, in Pelican, uh, in Pelican, in uh, XFabric, we need two building blocks. First, we need the socks with the packet switches as in a traditional distributed uh, fabric. But then we also need a set of cross point switches. And a cross point switch is a very simple component that has N ports and can set arbitrary circuits uh, uh, among pairs of ports. And when traffic comes in on one port, it is, it is uh, forwarded through the circuit directly to the outgoing port. So for example, here's a schematic representation of a cross point switch with N ports connected to uh, a set of socks. And because there are no circuits established, basically um, there is no connectivity on the socks because the signal is not forwarded. But now we can establish <coughs> circuits and now the corresponding <coughs> socks gets connected at the physical level because the cross point uh, switch starts to forward the signal. And it's really as if the, uh, a cable was plugged in between the socks because the only thing that the cross point switch does is forward the signal. So it does no queuing, no packet inspection, it doesn't know what a packet is, and so it's very similar to, to a cable. And the latency is very low and bounded. So it's, uh, for the, for the um, components we use, it's around two nanoseconds for the forwarding. And now, uh, of course, we can change the circuit configuration and the physical connectivity between the socks is changing. So we can build topologies using that technique. So if here's a simple example of a topology that is instantiated by a circuit configuration on the switch. And now we can change the uh, circuit configuration and change the topology at runtime. And the good news is that these cross point switches are commodity parts that are available as single silicon chips. So we can buy today a 160 port cross point switch uh, at 12 gig, 12.5 uh, gigabits per second per port, and that's all within 45 millimeter, 45 square millimeter uh, form factor. And the cost for that is extremely low because this uh, component is very simple. So uh, it's around three dollars per port for 12.5 uh, gig, which is significantly lower what a pa uh, than what a packet switch at the same rate uh, would cost. And vendors ensure that they can build up to around 300 ports at 16 gigabits per second without changing their manufacturing process significantly. So that's, that's all great. We can build these reconfigurable topologies, but how much does it cost? How many chips do we actually need? Well, let's take a simple example. Say we have a rack with 300 socks and six <coughs> ports per sock. How many uh, cross point switches do we need? Well, let's first think that we could have full reconfigurability, meaning that all the ports of all the socks can be directly connected by a circuit. Um, now, how can we do that? The simplest thing to do would be to have a single cross point switch and connect all the ports to it. And then you could establish any circuits within that uh, single cross point switch. But can we do that? Actually, uh, at rack scale, we can't really do it because if we look at the scale, that requires around 1,800 ports on a single cross point, and this is way too high of what a single cross point can provide. So can we enable full reconfigurability at rack scale? Well, we can. We can build it using multiple cross point uh, switches and compose them in what is called a folded clause topology. But um, the problem is that while this is offering the same abstraction as a single uh, chip. If we want a fully non-blocking folded clause topology, we will require a significant number of ports because there are additional ports for internal connectivity, this bit here. Uh, and so we would need something like th 30, 300 port chips. So this is a significant overhead in power and uh, cost for the rack. So uh, we assume that the full reconfigurability is actually way too expensive. So in fact, in XFabric, what we do is we trade off a bit of uh, reconfigurability to significantly reduce costs. So instead of having any two ports uh, 
that can be connected by a circuit, we just ensure that each port can, can be connected to any other SOC uh, in, the, in the rack, but not necessarily on the port on any port. So it's a slightly less reconfigurability, but it buys us that we can now reduce the number of chips. So if we um, connect each SOC to a different cross point on each of its ports, we end up with having, in this example, only six cross point switches, and um, the uh, only ports on the same cross point switch can be connected. So all the socks can still be. Yes? Oh, sorry, on the, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but on the, on the diagram on the left there, what's the, what's the effect of having multiple, having to go through multiple um, chips? Is that significant? Well, so the, the cost of uh, the, the latency is very low in propagation, so it's okay. not too much. It, okay. So, uh, as I said, it's at like two nanoseconds plus the time to actually reach the chip. It's, it's a handful of nanoseconds. It's not significant. The cost of the, cost of the chips or the power, is it? Uh, we, yeah, and, and I think pr probably the power, because you have an enclosure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, in X Fabric. We, with this design, we only ne would need, in, for this example, six cross-point uh, chips with 300 ports for the entire rack. And this represents a 5x uh, reduction in both cost and power while trading off just a bit of, of uh, flexibility. And so in, ge in the general case for N socks and D ports per sock, we would need uh, D cross-point chips with N ports. Uh, this is, the architecture is actually quite simple. So we have our, the required number of cross point chips. Uh, we have the socks and then each sock is connected to every cross point. So this is the example for sock one and this is for sock two, but you need to imagine that all of them are connected to the cross points. And as I said, we would need D cross points and um, N ports per cross point and N socks with D, with D ports. Uh, but now we need to actually manage this dynamically. We need to establish circuits to instantiate topologies. And this is done by a controller. The controller operates at rack scale. It runs, it's a process that runs on one of the socks. It's, um, it receives periodic updates about traffic statistics from all the servers within the rack. And it builds a traffic matrix within the rack uh, using these statistics. And then periodically, it generates a topology that is optimized for that traffic matrix. Um, and for that, it uses uh, a fast topology generation algorithm that is able to handle partial reconfigurability. So we uh, manage the cost of the complexity of having partial reconfigurability in uh, <coughs> software. So the generation algorithm produces only topologies that can be instantiated with the given hardware. And it's a fast, greedy algorithm because we need to reconfigure uh, on rel relatively frequently in the order of seconds or something like that. And um, once the topology has been computed, the controller actually updates uh, the circuit configuration on the cross points using a control plane. And it also needs to update the forwarding tables on the socks because we need to forward packets over the new topology. So this is done on a periodic basis. So to evaluate uh, this design, uh, we uh, use a, a simulator and a prototype, but due to uh, time constraints, I'm only, only going to show results for the prototype. So the prototype is composed of 27 servers and six circuit switches to which every server is connected. So each server has multiple network interfaces, and each of them is connected to a different cross point switch. And um, we need servers because we don't have socks yet. So each server emulates the, um, the functionality of the SOC. And in particular, it acts as a software packet switch. So it receives packets on one interface and according to the destination, sends them on a different interface for forwarding. Um, the servers support unmodified applications. They support TCP IP that is forwarded through multiple hops. And for the circuit switches, um, we have a, a nice design by uh, Daniel Klederho uh, that uses a, a non-blocking cross-point commodity ASIC at one gigabits uh, per port. And so I am responsible for most of the uh, software design uh, in the system. And so to, for the evaluation, uh, we have uh, 
flow level trace of a production workload, and we use that to generate a synthetic trace that is then replayed on the servers. So when a server replays the trace, it creates TCP flows to different destinations uh, according to the trace. And these uh, TCP flows, uh, yeah, we, the, the servers use TCP IP. And we compare the we measure the average path length and the completion time. And so one of the interesting, one of the things we wanted to know is how fast shall we reconfigure to get benefit. So if we measure the path length in function of the reconfiguration period on the controller, and we compare it to the 3D torus, we can see that as we get more frequent reconfigurations, the pass length actually drops. And this is because the topology that is more aggressively targeting the workload and matches uh, the requirements. So flows become shorter. Yes? Um, for how long is the cross point down while you reconfigure it? It's, uh, so one benefit of the electrical uh, circuit switching is that it's very fast. So it's like 70 nanoseconds or something. 70 nanoseconds. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all done within the chip. It's, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and um, we can see that, well, obviously the, the 3D torus is not changing because it's a static topology. Uh, but interestingly, that even at this small scale, we have benefit uh, having this reconfiguration. And now let's have a look at the completion time. Uh, we normalize it to the 3D torus and we, for the same experiment. And we can see that as we uh, reconfigure more and more often, the, the completion time actually drops. And this is because each TCP flow now is an average shorter. It uses less network resources. And therefore, the good put of the network is increasing. And uh, this happens up to a certain point. Uh, if we reconfigure like once per second, we have something like 23% uh, improvement. But then, interestingly, it increases again if we reconfigure every 100 milliseconds. And this is happening because every time we reconfigure, we can lose packets. And TCP is very bad at handling lost packets because it assumes it's, it's a congestion, so it drops the, the throughput. Uh, and um, we can see that, yeah, the best we achieved for this experiment is uh, on a second per second uh, reconfiguration where we have 23% improvement compared to the 3D torus. Now, this might seem not very big, but actually it's, 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 it's a positive result because the scale is relatively small and then therefore the torus behaves relatively well. Uh, but as we increase the scale, the torus increasingly requires more hops. So at rack scale, we actually see in the simulation about a 5x improvement compared to uh, the, the X fabric for the same workload. So, uh, uh, yes. So I presented these two projects that, uh, in which basically I tried to illustrate uh, the benefits and the challenges of, highly, of designing things at rack scale, of this rack scale computer approach. Um, so I did that first for storage with Pelican and then for networking with Xfabric. And for both projects, we see that uh, designing systems at rack scale has uh, significant benefits, but it also has additional challenges. And this uh, additional complexity uh, is, can be very well addressed in software. So uh, the lessons learned, I can mention that basically um, right provisioning the resources for the workload is, uh, offers very good performance per dollar for certain workloads. Uh, uh, but in some cases, you also need to dynamically adapt at runtime. And this is better done with um, as, less, as, uh, as less complexity as possible in software in hardware, sorry, and as much as possible pushing it to the software. And uh, so we are currently uh, doing a, another project, which is called Falcon. It's about uh, storage, but it's um, um, not cold storage like Pelican. It's a more generic storage system. And here we try to merge the lessons learned for, the, for both projects. Uh, so we inject some, at, at very low cost and with simple hardware, we inject some reconfigurability within uh, the system. And this is a, a prototype uh, that it sits on the third floor. So if you're interested, I can show you 
today or, or tomorrow. Uh, and with Falcon, uh, we circuit switch disks, well, circuit switch storage, we circuit switch SSDs currently. So this is the 120 SSDs, this is one circuit switch, and this is uh, designed by Hugh Williams. Um, and now, inst and you have some servers you don't see. And now instead of having direct attach storage on each of the servers, you can attach each SSD to an arbitrary server within the rack and then flexibly adapting to the demand, uh, both in load balancing and scaling uh, the compute to storage ratio. Um, thank you. So in a couple of points, um, you had to, you know, you chose maybe a greedy algorithm because you needed to be fast or a static layout of classes and so on. And there are obviously some kind of big optimization problems that you could imagine applying at runtime to further optimize these things. Um, so I think we discussed that at some We've point. We've discussed right? it in terms of two racks for Pelican. So if you're going to double yes. provision, then. So that, but, that, it, but my question is more in general, there are these optimization problems. Um, so, so, oh, yeah. 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 Do, do you do you want to look at those? Um, do you know where to go in the lab to help for help with those, uh, etc.? So we, we um, actually have a follow-up project uh, uh, for Pelican that is called Flamingo, in which we try to well, in which we did automate the uh, design of these racks uh, using a solver. So we tried with Dead Three, and it was. Um, so we tried for a long time. Um, we didn't quite succeed with that three. So we uh, wrote a custom solver, um, but it's now automated. Yes. And then. Cool. Was there an improvement? Um, over some, you know, over like static baseline or whatever. So if we look at the provisioning that Pelican Pelican has, the layout that is automatically generated performs the same way. Right. So we we are. Uh, the same for Pelican. But the flexibility now is that we can vary the provisioning, vary the design, and generate a new uh, storage stack within a few hours instead of uh, like a few months like we did manually in Pelican. So huge improvement, yes, uh, but not for Pelican. Cool. So I think with the Pelican stuff, you're making the assumption that all of the disks for the erasure code, to read back from the erasure coding, all of the disks for a particular blob have to be act, uh, active at the same yep. time. If you added some buffering uh, and potentially took a hit on the latency and had a more complicated scheduler, is there potential to improve the, the throughput? The thing is that you need to be careful with buffering because we store potentially very, very large blobs. It could be hundreds of gigabytes. So if you start buffering things, you need to be very careful in bounding the buffering and it's unclear that you'll be able to do it in the general case for a arbitrary size blobs. Um, so obviously, buffering would help, but we really need to be careful about that, and that's why we, we didn't do it. Okay. Any more questions? Sorry, just one more. 14 seconds sounds like a long time. How much of that is the FSUG? And can you use a simpler file system or? Uh, so I think Richard looked deeply into that, and uh, the numbers we have now are significantly lower than this. Uh, maybe uh, something like 2x uh, better. Don't need to buy which desks you want. Okay. <laughs> um, well, we, we uh, actually, actually sort of, we looked very carefully at the software costs, and uh, we made some changes to Windows to eliminate or ameliorate those. So now it's dominated by the which desks you want. You get a different answer depending which desks you want. Okay. Okay, any more questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again.